inequality is getting wider, the rich are doing extremely well. Extraordinary. Across the developed world, inequality has increased. Business is doing well. Business profit margins, terrific compared to the, the record of story. In the past, the people have had a lot more wealth and power than everyone else have used an effective tool to justify that inequality. That tool has been religion. The king deserves to be king because God says so. The nobility deserves to have much more than the peasants because the church says so. End of story. But then came the Enlightenment and the idea that all men are created equal. An idea so powerful that it fueled a number of violent revolutions. An idea so powerful that it can be found in today's most precious texts, our constitutions. The US Declaration of Independence starts off by establishing that all men are created equal. The UN Declaration of Human Rights states that all human beings are born free and equal. Also in my home country, Sweden, the very first chapter of the Constitution establishes the equal worth of all human beings. This idea that everyone is created equal did create problems for the rich and the powerful. Because if everyone is created equal, then the wealthy and powerful can no longer use religion as a tool to justify the fact that some people have vastly more power and wealth than everyone else. So what has happened since the advent of the Enlightenment? Have we now eliminated inequality to actually achieve equality? Well, we all know that we have done no such thing. What has happened instead is that the wealthy and the powerful have replaced religion with a new justification for inequality. Now, the, the premise that we're all created equal is the opening line of the American story. And while we don't promise equal outcomes, we strive to deliver equal opportunity. Equality of opportunity is what we settle on instead of trying to achieve the equality that our constitutions talk about. Meritocracy is the tool we use to achieve equality of opportunity, and social mobility is the evidence we have that the meritocracy tool actually works. The idea that success doesn't depend on being born into wealth or privilege, it depends on effort and merit. In this video, I've decided to look into this non-religious and ostensibly enlightenment-friendly justification for inequality, meritocracy. And to do that, I traveled from Stockholm to Malmö to meet the author and journalist Petter Larsson, who recently released a book titled Rigged, how the belief in meritocracy lessens the chance of social mobility. A lot of people believe that we have equal opportunities to become anything. The Carpenter's daughter can become a professor. The cleaner's son could become a, a CEO or, or something. And it creates a lots, of, lots of problems in our societies, I believe. First of all, because it's not true. And second of all, because people believe it to be true. This is a Hollywood actor, Stellan Skarsgård. You've probably seen him in Good Will Hunting, Dune, or in any other of the 100 or so movies he's been in. Stellan has many sons. For example, Alexander, who's also a successful actor, famous from True Blood and Big Little Lies. Gustav, who's also a successful actor, famous from Vikings and Westworld. Bill, who's also a successful actor, famous from It and Deadpool 2. Walter, who's also a successful actor, famous from Arn and Black Lake. And another child, who's also a successful child actor. A year ago, the term Meepo Baby started trending on social media and has since then been written about in numerous media articles. To me, the popularity of this term hints at a renewed attention to how power and wealth are distributed in society across generations. The Skarsgård family is an obvious example of a Nipo baby family, but if you start looking for Nipo baby families, you'll find them everywhere, and not only within media and entertainment. So what do the families like these and the popularity of the term Nipo baby say about social mobility and in turn about meritocracy and equality of opportunity. Since we as a society have decided to not do that much about inequality and instead settle on equality of opportunity, our society has a highly limited number of positions of wealth and power. For every such scarce position that is maintained from one generation to the next, within families that already have wealth and power, there is one less position of wealth and power that someone from a family without wealth and power can climb to. 
So if all positions of wealth and power stay within the same families over generations, then we don't really have the social mobility that was supposed to demonstrate that we have a meritocratic society with equality of opportunity. In other words, the Nepo baby phenomenon indicates that today's justification for inequality is a lie. Of course, some may dismiss Nepo babies as outliers that don't reflect society's overall social mobility. It turns out though that there is a whole field of research dedicated to measuring social mobility and the metrics researchers use when they measure social mobility is persistence. Persistence is how alike are children and their parents. How much of the parents' advantages and disadvantages remain with the children? Because you do not inherit 100% uh, class position or uh, income or, or something. You, you inherit a percentage on average. So what you do is you take the uh, parent generation and you compare them to the average in the parent generation. And then you take the children's generation and you compare the children to the average in the children's generation. And then you can calculate uh, the uh, correlations between parents and children. And you can say you inherit in a way. So persistence is how much remains, how much do you inherit uh, from your parents or from your upbringing. Persistence is often evaluated through metrics like education, health and occupation. But most studies focus on economic persistence or intergenerational earnings elasticity. Essentially, researchers examine how likely children are to earn similarly to their parents. And the researchers have uncovered three interesting things. First of all, income persistence varies a lot between different countries. Countries like Brazil, India, the UK and USA have high persistence levels, in other words, low economic social mobility. Countries like Denmark, Norway and my country Sweden have lower levels of persistence, in other words, more economic mobility between generations. Now, even these low figures of correlations when it comes to income, let's say Sweden, uh, where we have a persistence of, say, 30%. That means that 30% is inherited throughout the generations, which means that it takes at least 100 years from, for a family that starts at the bottom 10% to reach the average. 100 years, three, four generations. Second, researchers have also found that there seems to be a connection between income persistence and inequality. Countries with low levels of economic social mobility, high persistence, tend to have higher levels of inequality as measured by the Gini coefficients. Researchers call this the Great Gatsby Curve. Inequality tends to cement itself by making uh, social mobility uh, more difficult. If there's a huge distance between, say, the poorest 20% and the richest 10% in a country, it's also much more difficult to climb from, from the uh, bottom to the top. Indeed, the research shows that within each country, persistence is not uniform across the income distribution. Instead, there are what researchers call sticky floors and sticky ceilings, meaning that the poorest children and the richest children are likely to stay within or close to their respective brackets. Most of the actual mobility occurs between different levels in the middle. A study has even shown that among the super duper rich in Sweden, among the 0.01%, economic persistence is close to 90%. The research we've looked at so far, which compares one generation to the next, indicates that social mobility is so low that it takes between two and 11 generations for a poor family to achieve average income. But it gets worse because some researchers have designed clever methods to measure social mobility over many centuries. And what they have discovered about social mobility is truly stunning. In the year 1066, William the Conqueror and his troops invaded England and defeated King Harold at the Battle of Hastings, a conquest that would end up having huge consequences, not only for English history, but also for our understanding today about social mobility. Now, what happened in England 
is not only that the Normans conquered England, but they replaced, entirely replaced, uh, the Anglo-Saxons as a ruling class over a few decades. Now, every state official, every clergy member, every high church official, they were replaced by Normans. So in a few decades, England changed their ruling class. It happened very fast. Now, happily enough, we know the names of these Norman conquerors. Uh, Montgomery, Talbot, Darcy. So why does this matter? Why does it matter that researchers today know the rare surnames of the ruling elite from 1,000 years ago? Well, because researchers have been able to use these surnames that were in the elite 1,000 years ago to track social mobility across generations until today. More specifically, the economic historian Greg Clark has studied admission lists to the elite universities Oxford and Cambridge and analyzed whether the Norman surnames have maintained an overrepresentation there across the generations. That way he's been able to infer actual rates of elite status persistence. In the end, today, there is still a small overrepresentation of Norman offsprings of these families with these uh, Norman names at Oxbridge today. So it's taken a thousand years, I mean a thousand years as a really, really long time, and they can still be identified as a little bit above average in England today. These researchers, they have done the same kind of studies, not going back a thousand years, but a few hundred years at least, uh, in several other countries like China, like Sweden, and they have come up with persistence figures of about 70 or 80 percent, which is far more than the usual measurements. All these huge changing of society over the years, about democratization, mass education, industrialism, capitalism, which has happened during these last 300 years. I shouldn't say that it hasn't changed anything, it's changed a lot, but it doesn't seem to have affected social mobility that much. Despite that, researchers have found that 65% of Swedes and 50% of Americans believe that the system is basically fair since everyone in the country has an equal opportunity to succeed. And 32% of Swedes and 46% of Americans believe that the poor are poor because of a lack of effort on his or her own part. And 38% of Swedes and 39% of Americans believe that the rich are rich because he or she worked harder than others. This is Oprah Winfrey. She was born into poverty in rural Mississippi to a teenage single mother facing abuse and teenage pregnancy. Today, she's a multi-billionaire and one of the world's most influential people. This is Andrew Carnegie, a Scottish immigrant who worked in a Pittsburgh cotton factory as a boy. By the end of his life, he had transformed the American steel industry and became one of the richest Americans of all time. This is Howard Schultz, raised in a humble housing complex in Brooklyn, where he experienced poverty firsthand. Today, he's a billionaire businessman celebrated as the driving force between Starbucks' global success. These stories, rags to riches stories, uh, are really, really important uh, for upholding the illusion of social mobility. Uh, you could take, for example, a Swedish example would be John Eliasson. His father was a metal worker, his mother was a seamstress, was born in a working class neighborhood in Gothenburg, and he becomes the uh, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, that is really, really an achievement. Or Zlatan Ibrahimovic, uh, for example, from this uh, town here where we live in Malmö, becomes a world-renowned football player. And there are numerous examples of this. Now these stories from Rags to Riches, they sell the idea that uh, social mobility is possible. And it is, for a few people, for a very few people. But it sells it to everybody. Um, and that, that is a really important function. Now, the French uh, sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, he called these uh, les miraculeux, the miraculous ones. Their function is to, to make people believe that the system is fair, uh, while for the big majority it is not. In his book, Petter argues that this misplaced belief in meritocracy that these stories help create is a huge problem. Why? The belief that we live in a meritocratic society, which people tend to see as a just society, 
that means that they are willing to accept uh, larger inequality because inequality is well earned. Uh, the poor people are lazy, uh, they are not that talented, while the rich people, the successful people, they are considered talented and hardworking. So in that sense, it would be fair to, to, to have a greater inequality. And this effect has actually been measured by the Dutch researcher Jonathan Mies, who has found that the more unequal a country is, the more its inhabitants believe in meritocracy. Jonathan Mies calls this the paradox of inequality, and if you stop to think about it, it's a pretty profound discovery. Because if you recall the Great Gatsby curve, the more unequal a country is, the higher the persistence levels are. In other words, the more unequal a society is, the less meritocratic it actually is. But despite that, people tend to believe more in meritocracy in these unequal societies. That the illusion just grows stronger and at the same time while well, the real world inequality also grows stronger they go hand in hand my name is Anders Asvedo and this is the market exit a channel where I publish short documentaries about law fairness and capitalism and I decided to make this one after I read Petter Larsson's book rigged and if you can read Swedish I do highly recommend this book. The book forced me to challenge my own assumptions about meritocracy and it did leave me thinking about my own life, career and achievements. And obviously the book includes much more than I had time to talk about in the video, so I will let Petter say a few more words about the book. But before that, since you've come this far, maybe you found value in this video. If so, please help me out by liking the video, by subscribing to my channel and by most importantly by sharing the video with your family, a few friends and a couple of colleagues. I want to make more documentaries like this and I want to freely share them on platforms like YouTube. But for me to keep doing that, I need your support. If you like what I'm doing on this channel, go to patreon.com slash themarketexits. I'm deeply grateful for all my supporters. Now, let's hear some more from Petter Larsson. Now, this is what it looks like in Swedish. Riggat would be the title, rigged. The book is really divided into two parts where in the first empirical part uh, I say what to, to what extent can we talk about uh, equal opportunity and to what extent do we inherit traits uh, and advantages and disadvantages from our parents or from our upbringing and in the second part I discuss uh, which is the most more interesting part really I discuss what what type of problems do, do uh, these beliefs create in our society <laughs>